Yup, it's time for another video game review, and this time we're taking a look at Mickey Mouse, and Oswald, and many more in the Disney universe. This time we're covering Epic Mickey 2, The Power of Two, and surely a game featuring Disney's beloved mascot as the main character can't be bad, right? Right? Well, yes. And no. Let's talk about it. We kick things off with a brief recap of the events in the last game in which Mickey stumbled into the wasteland and saved everyone from the Mad Doctor with Oswald's help. Fast forward a bit and Wasteland is in trouble once again. The area has been ravaged by constant earthquakes, sending Oswald and the other tunes running for cover, and Oswald is nearly crushed by a falling building but is saved at the last moment by the Mad Doctor. Stop me if you've heard this before. The Mad Doctor claims to be performed and no longer interested in causing trouble like he did in the first game. Surely he's not lying, right? Nah, that can't be. The Doctor claims a new threat is coming to Wasteland very soon and asks Oswald to come with him so the two can begin making preparations to fight it. Hortensia isn't convinced, but Oswald decides to go with the Doctor nonetheless because... Come on, Hortensia! Doesn't everybody deserve a second chance? Great argument, Oswald. It's not like he tried to kill all of you or anything like that. Hortensia and Gus decide to send a message to Mickey to get him to come back to Wasteland to help deal with the problem. Mickey sneaks through Yensid's lab to get his trusty brush back and gets ready to thin everyone's houses out one poor soul at a time. Mickey and Oswald meet up and decide to go to Mean Street to talk to the Mad Doctor together, although they have to take the long route to get there since Wasteland's fast travel projectors were damaged by the earthquakes. After getting there, the Mad Doctor tells them the Blotlings are the ones responsible for tearing up Wasteland. He takes off to help some friends or some shit, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Gus tells Mickey and Oswald they need to get the projectors working again before turning their attention to the Doctor. They meet up with Gremlin Jamface and learn the controls for the projectors were shut down before the earthquake started, implying someone or something else is causing trouble behind the scenes. Gee, I wonder who. The crew takes a trip to Oztown to chat with Gremlin Prescott to find a way to get to Rainbow Caverns and fix the projectors, but Prescott tells them the only way there is blocked by a thinner spillage which Jamface trusted Goofy to fix for some reason. Because trusting Goofy with an important task always goes really well. After dealing with that, the group gets the projectors up and running again and the Doc contacts Oswald through his remote control and claims he has some wonderful news to share and they need to head to the Doc's lab to find out what it is. On a side note, is there anything Oswald's remote can't do? There's no speaker on it as far as I can see, so how is he receiving audio through it? Given all the shit that remote can do, I'm surprised Oswald hasn't used it to make himself supreme ruler of the universe by now. Mickey and Oswald reach the lab, but the Doc is nowhere to be found, and the duo is ambushed by a massive animatronic monster, which they handle without any problems. The Mad Doctor conveniently shows up after the fight is over, almost like he was, dare I say, controlling the monster? Oh shit, did I just say that? I ruined the twist, never mind that part. The Doc talks about giving up his life as a normal tune and assuming an animatronic form to control the blood and launch an attack on Wasteland in the first game and that all he really wants is to return to normal. Everyone returns to Mean Street and things seem to be on the come up, but Small Pete shows up and shows everyone a gag toy he found while fixing the projectors in Rainbow Caverns, proving the projectors weren't ruined by the quakes but instead sabotaged. And since Gremlin Prescott is in charge of the gag factory, the crew decides to find him to get to the bottom of the situation. After a few pit stops, the guys catch up to Prescott, who admits to sabotaging the projectors because he was frustrated with not receiving the recognition he thought he deserved at the gag factory. And wow, this is a really stupid reason to turn on your friends. Prescott takes control of his new machine to take down Mickey and Oswald so he can steal Mickey's brush and obtain ultimate power, leading to a two-phase boss fight that perfectly illustrates why the aiming system in this game needed some extra work, but I'll get back to that later. Prescott is defeated and this weird bird thing shoots him up with drugs to get him to spill the truth about what's been going on. He claims to be solely responsible for all the trouble that's been happening in Wasteland since the start of the game. The major threat seems to be taken care of, but Mickey has his doubts about whether Prescott was actually working alone. Gus finds some old blueprints detailing a project Prescott was working on in Ventureland, so the group heads over there to find out why Prescott betrayed them. 
Once there, they learn the construction type Prescott was using has been closed down by the Mad Doctor, which is awfully suspicious. One might even conclude the Doc is... destroying evidence? Nah, that can't be. Oswald gets upset after Daisy calls him out for being useless and he goes into a corner to sulk. I gotta tell you, my love for Oswald's character is growing every second he's on screen. After running some errands for unappreciative NPCs and dealing with some thinner in a random area of wasteland nobody cares about, Mickey and Oswald find themselves in the Mad Doctor's attic where Jamface is being held captive. After freeing him, Mickey and co. find a secret room with a book containing information about the Mad Doctor's true intentions, which the Doctor decided to write down for some reason. In a plot twist that surprised absolutely nobody, the Mad Doctor reveals he never changed and that he was still evil the entire time. Wow, you can just feel the effort that went into writing this story, can't ya? Turns out the Mad Doc was manipulating Prescott behind the scenes so Prescott would build a huge broadcast relay allowing the Doctor to spread his legend throughout Wasteland and become the most popular tune of all time, even more popular than Mickey himself. Oswald is visibly upset upon finding out the truth, and understandably so I'd be pissed off too if I fell for a scheme this obvious, and he decides to go confront the Doctor. But the Doc is one step ahead and has already rounded up most of Mickey and Oswald's companions and threatens to kill, I mean really hurt them, if Mickey and Oswald don't surrender. Mickey nearly gives in, but Oswald convinces him to fight on. They destroy the Mad Doctor's machine, sending him straight toward a pool of thinner. Mickey and Oswald jump down to save him, even though he just tried to murder all their friends and loved ones, because... That's what heroes do! Okay, Mickey, whatever you say. The Doc accepts Mickey and Oswald's friendship and becomes a natural tune again, which kind of makes you wonder why he didn't just lead with that instead of doing all the pretend to be a good guy for two minutes bullshit. Wasteland is saved, a giant parade is thrown to commemorate the occasion, and Mickey and Oswald spend the day together to celebrate their friendship. This game's story is one big collection of meh. I've certainly seen worse, but I will admit I turned my brain off a few times throughout. To start, the pacing is very bad. It's way too slow for the majority of the adventure, and then way too fast at the end. The first main objective you're given is to fix the projectors, which takes hours of game time to accomplish. What do you do after this? You have to find out who sabotaged the projectors. Why is so much of the game's story devoted to these damn projectors? On the other hand, the entire sequence of the Mad Doctor revealing his true intentions only to turn around and become good again happens in under 30 minutes of game time, and it feels so rushed. The climax comes out of nowhere, and even when it does come, you're not interested in the slightest because it features one of the most predictable plot twists you'll ever see. I know I poked fun at the twist a few times while recapping the story, but it's honestly hard not to because it's so obvious that it's coming. Wasteland is a huge place with loads of potentially interesting locations to explore, but you spend the majority of your time here as an impromptu mechanic, and it feels lazy. Did the other tunes really need Mickey's help to solve this problem, because it seems like they could have easily handled it without him? There were a few moments in this game that made me laugh, for one, seeing Oswald get his face rearranged by Pete Tronic was pretty funny, but these moments are few and far between. This is a generic, uninspired Disney story pretty much the whole way through, and it's not a narrative I'll ever be inclined to revisit. The story is kind of a wash, but the presentation of the game is much better. In fact, I think it's the best part of the game. It takes the classic 2D visuals that made Disney so popular in the first place and blends them with a 3D style more akin to 21st century gaming, and I think the combination works pretty well here. The 2D grayscale areas you explore are short and sweet, and they provide a nice change of pace from the standard 3D areas. The majority of the cutscenes are 2D as well, allowing the characters to show more personality and emote properly when things happen, unlike the 3D cutscenes where the characters often look unnaturally stiff. This is admittedly a small thing, but it really annoys me the Mad Doctor sings most of his dialogue. Some might find this charming or cute, I find it annoying. The Doc is much easier to listen to after he goes back to being evil and remembers how to form a complete sentence. There is one significant issue with the presentation though, and that's the music and sound effects. There are several places in this game where there's no music at all, leaving you to listen to nothing but generic sound effects and Mickey and Oswald grunting every time they jump. What? 
I am reviewing the PC version of this game, so I'm not sure if this is a problem on the other versions, but it is so weird going through lengthy platforming sections without any music to listen to. Additionally, some tracks don't loop properly after they finish, leading to awkwardly long pauses before the music starts playing again. I don't know if this was developer oversight or issues with the game's coding or what, but this is not how you implement music into a video game. As for the music itself, it's pretty bland. Not awful necessarily, but I can't think of a single track that left a lasting impression on me other than the main menu theme. The music doesn't do a good job of complementing the areas you explore, and some of it is barely better than the unnatural silence you have to listen to on more than one occasion. Epic Mickey 2 is a standard collectathon platformer. You travel to an area, discover what the problem is, fix it, and then you move on to the next area. Mickey still has his trusty paint and thinner at his disposal, and this is the main gimmick of the game. Mickey can create objects by spraying them with paint, and he can remove them with thinner. The key to moving forward is usually figuring out which of the two needs to be used and how. You might need to use paint to reinstall some gears to get a machine working again, or use thinner to dissolve a platform so you can get to something that's just a bit out of reach. Given that the paint thinner mechanic is the most important function of the gameplay, it's somewhat disappointing that it's not handled better. You have very few options for dealing with enemies and obstacles other than using paint or thinner. Mickey can jump onto or spin into enemies as a form of attack, but both options are pathetically short range and will often lead to you taking way more damage than you dish out. This is a good time to mention Mickey has no invincibility frames in this game, and I mean zero. So if a group of enemies start pummeling you at once, you're probably going to take a ton of damage before you have the opportunity to do anything in reply. Mickey also has access to abilities called Sketches, which do offer a long-range alternative to the brush, but they have a really long recharge period, so if you screw up while using them, you've got to wait about 30 seconds before you get another shot, so the paint is going to be your best bet here. Granted, the paint and thinner don't have great range either. You're not able to fire them very far at all, and it is pretty annoying during certain sections of gameplay. The problem isn't too bad during regular gameplay, but it's awful during boss fights when you're expected to aim at targets that are either really far away from you or way above you. And speaking of aiming, good luck doing that in this game because the aiming system is all kinds of janky. Trying to hit any moving target outside of point blank range is an absolute crapshoot. You are going to flail around and miss wildly all the time, only for your supply of paint and thinner to run out, forcing you to either buy time until they recharge or run around in the middle of the fight to gather more. And while paint and thinner canisters are pretty easy to find during gameplay, once you do find some, you get to go back to the amazing thrill ride of missing your target 80% of the time. It is possible to upgrade Mickey's paint and thinner to replenish them faster, but to do this you have to awaken things known as spirits. How do you get spirits? By collecting pins, these items that are scattered throughout the game world as well as in shops you can buy them from using red tickets you'll collect throughout the adventure. I don't mind the idea of pins, but the benefits you gain from collecting them are so insignificant it's just not worth the time. You're better off putting up with the janky aiming system and just pushing through it rather than spending the time necessary to find all these pins. In fact, most of the collectibles in this game are downright useless. The main ones you'll gather are scrap metal, tickets, and film. I gathered over 500 units of film while I played this game, and to be honest, I can't even tell you what they're used for, and I don't really care since I know it's something I wouldn't bother with anyway. Scrap metal is mostly just used to buy pins, and I already explained why those are useless. The items in this game don't really add to the experience or motivate you to explore more, they're just there for the sake of being there, and those are the worst types of items. And the side quests are pretty pointless as well, because most of them only amount to go to X place, get Y thing, and bring it back to Z character. And your reward for doing these quests is almost always some combination of pointless items you have no reason to want. Epic Mickey 2 is a fairly linear game, but unlike its predecessor, Mickey won't be braving the path on his own since this time Oswald is along for the ride, and... Well, Oswald's inclusion in the gameplay is... bittersweet. While Mickey rocks his paintbrush for the journey, Oswald is packing his trusty remote, which he can use to activate switches, reprogram hackable systems, and even create an electrical field to temporarily stun enemies. You know, typical platformer stuff. 
But Oswald's biggest problem isn't his moveset, that's totally fine. The problem is his AI. It's incredibly inconsistent and finicky. There are several situations in this game where Mickey and Oswald need to work together to overcome a situation, and there are times when Oswald decides he'd rather be doing anything else other than helping Mickey out. You do have the option of calling Oswald over to wherever your current position is by pushing a certain button, but don't expect that to be reliable since Oswald will either ignore you completely or he'll come over to you just to do something completely different than what you want him to do. Maybe you want him to turn something on, but he throws you halfway across the map instead. His AI is the most frustrating part of the gameplay, even more so than the shoddy aiming with Mickey's brush because this issue literally leads to situations where you are stuck and unable to progress for several minutes because Oswald won't get with the damn program. This problem could have been avoided somewhat by allowing the player to switch control from Mickey to Oswald and back whenever the situation called for it. That would have provided the upside of allowing you to control two characters as opposed to one while cutting back on the amount of time you spend wanting to strangle Oswald for doing something stupid. Even when you're controlling Mickey though, you're not completely safe from these control issues since for some reason the devs thought it was a good idea to put the jump command and the action command on the same button. The amount of times I wanted to jump only to do some random action I had no intention of doing left me a fair bit annoyed by the time I reached the end of the game. I like the idea of giving Mickey a friend to share this adventure with, but Oswald's problems on the gameplay side of things make him feel more like a last minute inclusion than a unique character with a different style of gameplay crafted for him. Simply put, he feels more like a crutch to Mickey than a companion. There was potential here, but it just wasn't fully realized. There's a very delicate balance in video games when it comes to player guidance. Some games hold the player's hand way too much, while others are way too cryptic and don't give you enough information to actually figure anything out. Epic Mickey 2 has a big problem with the former, since Gremlin Gus insists on treating Mickey and Oswald like they have single-digit IQs, although maybe they do since they were dumb enough to fall for the Doctor's scheme, and by extension he treats you that way as well. Gus loves to tell you exactly what you need to do the moment you enter a new area and tell you exactly how you need to go about doing it. Let me show you a few examples of what I mean. What is it? Some kind of security device? If it is, we could try taking out those panels on the side. Or maybe we can plug up those vents. Right. Let's go see what this place is. <laughs> He yells instructions to you repeatedly during both regular gameplay and boss fights, to the point that hearing his voice becomes an indicator to know when to turn your ears off for a few seconds. He's always hanging around in the game world, floating around at the exact location you need to go to next. It sucks the fun out of exploring the world around you since you rarely get a chance to investigate anything for yourself before the game spells out the solution for you. And that's a shame because the areas you get to visit aren't too shabby. I especially remember Blot Alley and Rainbow Caverns, the former due to the stealth sequence where you have to sneak past a load of blots to reach the exit, and the latter for its really cool combination of fire and water. Not every area in this game is a home run, but there are definitely some gems here. But again, the game is so hell-bent on spoon-feeding you information that the sense of satisfaction you get from exploring these areas is dramatically reduced. If Gus was simply available to ask for help if you were unsure of what to do or where to go next, this wouldn't really be a problem, because then players who needed a bit of guidance could get it without being treated like babies. I mean, the level design in this game isn't exactly some complex labyrinth, so I'm unsure why the developers felt the need to do this. It was completely unnecessary. The gameplay does show flashes of greatness, and there was definitely potential for a much better game here. But the core of it all rarely makes it past surface level content. Flip this switch, activate this button, turn this thing on, etc. Using paint and thinner to mess around with the environment is pretty fun at first, but since you are rarely encouraged to actually explore anything, the design feels like it's contradicting itself. Epic Mickey 2 was tasked with taking the series to a new level, and from a gameplay perspective, it certainly failed to do that.
Epic Mickey 2 didn't sell well at all after it released in 2012, and after playing the game, it's pretty easy to understand why. It's not a dumpster fire by any means, but that isn't really saying much in the game's defense. I wouldn't mind seeing the series get another shot, but seeing as the studio that made this game shut down a long time ago, I seriously doubt that's ever going to happen. But honestly, maybe that's a blessing in disguise. Epic Mickey 2 earned a 5.5 out of 10. I don't recommend checking this game out unless you're really, really curious. Unless you're a diehard Disney fan who gets a kick out of playing mediocre games, you're not going to miss much by skipping over this one.